We've got hey, I'm Luis, and this, and this is Luis, and welcome to the Content is Profit podcast. In here, you're going to get the insights, accountability, and drive to create consistently and increase revenue. You'll hear from top entrepreneurs, creators, and anything and everything you need to know about content, all this while having a good time. The goal of this podcast is simple, to entertain, educate, and turn your content into profit. Let's go. I want to I, I wanna say something before, before the topic to Today. Okay, what do you want Contentsprofit.com is live. Episodes Ooh. are dropping on our website every single day. There's going to be like four new episodes. We're backtracking. I think we're up to episode 200 and something that have been up- updated. So pat in the back. Good job. Yeah, you've done all the work. So pat in the back for you Sh- indeed. Yeah, shout out to our, <laughs> our web team. Nathan, thank you, brother. All right, uh, what are we talking about today? Right, so today we have an incredible guest and we're going to be talking all about finding an extra 250k or 1 million in backend revenue pocket change Ooh. pocket change no i'm kidding okay yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty that's pretty, that's pretty sweet. significant honestly that's pretty, you significant. Know, pretty significant this can change people's life you know Absolutely. maybe people movie. that are stuck in the in the grind in the hustle and they yet don't have a predictable or sustainable business mm. i think today's conversation is for them today is gonna be fire all right Anything else, Fonz? <laughs> you, you forgot what, you, what comes next. <laughs> uh, but what comes next? Guys, I know. Wait, this is the old GG. Come on. Wait, if, this is the old GG. If you G-G. enjoyed today's episode, please don't forget to share it, follow it, like it. Ah, all the, all the go. good, positive things. Leave some some reviews in there. Show some love. There we go. I just wanted to know if, if you were like up to par. You were awake. Yeah. You're good to go. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> so we're back with another guest. Today, you are in for a treat. We have a serial entrepreneur who has built multiple seven-figure businesses and earned a spot in the Inc. 5000. Woo. That is right. He's currently helping coaches build predictable, scalable, and sustainable business. Mm, so if that resonates with you, make sure to stay all the way to the end. He also is an amazing dad to two daughters, mm, maybe a future girlfriends for, you know, Luca Mattel. I don't know. <laughs> and national ranking karate champion. Yeah, after you read uh, that third one, you're I know, like, like, oh, yeah, it's okay. We're, we're not going to go there. <laughs> Guys, please welcome successful entrepreneur, <laughs> the real karate kid, and... Awesome dad, Michael Chu. What up, guys? What up? What's up, Michael? <laughs> so I got to just start with this. I grew up in New Jersey, like right outside of New York, listening to Z100. And uh, your guys opening brought me back to my Z100 days listening <laughs> to the radio. And uh, that was that was fun. So I'm excited to be here, guys. Oh, Appreciate yeah. it. I'm going to have to look it up to, you know, see the vibe, feel the vibes. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Thank you so much for, for that compliment. I know yeah. we. I'm just gonna say, Michael showed up and he was like all squared up, ready to tackle <laughs> you like, after that comment. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I know. Uh, Michael, you just you know background. You don't have a three year old and like a four month old, so you know, eh, you know, uh, if 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 you and me get along, maybe they get a chance. Who knows? I hear that. <laughs> now, but we're, yeah, I got a, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. There you a go. Five-year-old and a two-year-old. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Pl- plenty busy, I'm sure. Uh, but we're extremely honored to have you out here. Uh, one of the podcast friends, Sam, connected us, and uh, we yeah. we had a previous call, and it was like, oh man, we have to talk about this. I know that there's some focus on, on your side, but hidden revenue from two hundred and fifty thousand to a million dollars. That businesses are just like living on the table. And they don't know what it is. But before we dive into that, can you share a little bit of your background? We know that you built several um, uh, seven-figure businesses. You bought businesses. You're like in this amazing world. Um, So how did that start? Man, whenever I'm asked that question, I feel like you could tell a whole life story. It's been about 20 years, but I'll try and- We can do the uh, We can do the two-minute version. (laughs) Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it super brief. Uh, I mean, I heard you guys joking earlier about the 250000 to a $1 million in hidden pockets of revenue. Our business currently uh, helps six, but really seven-figure CEOs and entrepreneurs uh, unlock hidden pockets of revenue. I was you know, mm. One of our, one of our uh, heads of de- uh, delivery, Luis, jokes, um, <laughs> you know, for example, we had a student, Bastion, the other day. He told us in the first 10 weeks with us, uh, he unlocked $956,000 in additional revenue implementing what we're doing. And so our team always jokes, you know, every $956,000 in revenue, every $956,000 helps. But um, wow. in all seriousness, my story started back, I was a, a national champion throughout most of my teens and early 20s. Um, as I was in high school, I was looking for, you know, what I call beer and gas money. And I was working at Pizza Hut. Uh, I was pretty shy uh, at the time. So I, was, I felt like at that point, I was on a track to, you know, get a job. 
Um, yep. That's kind of how I grew up. My mom's a teacher. My, my grandparents on both sides were farmers. And so work hard, get a job was kind of the story that I was raised with and yeah. what I was expecting. Uh, but that summer, I realized that Pizza Hut money wasn't going to pay the bills. <laughs> and that's when I landed my first sales job. Mm. And uh, what unfolded from there was the next 10 or 15 years of building three different direct sales organizations, um, generating over $100 million in revenue with those three teams. And then went on to consult with eight, nine, and even 10 figure companies, building out direct sales organizations from there. And then about five years ago, I decided to start my own coaching businesses. We now have two uh, seven figure coaching businesses. As you've referenced, one uh, was just ranked uh, one of the Inc. 5,000 fastest growing companies. And uh, that's kind of where we are today. I tried to keep that in two minutes, but uh, <laughs> that that's, was that's, so a, that's good. a quick background. Yeah, that was yeah. good. That was a good, um, you know, a lot of the, the show we've obviously diving into entrepreneurship and the mindset aspect of not only running the company, but on the content production side of things. But I'm very curious, right? Like we, we grew up in a very similar environment where our, our mother was a, a college professor, right? Like there's like no entrepreneurs in our family, yeah. at least that we could like grab, you know, uh, or, or give him a phone call. Uh, how was that transition mentally, right? Like what was like that journey growth wise from making that decision? You know, maybe the job is not the route, right? The, the entrepreneurship. And then what are some of those first steps that you took on to, to start growing on your own platform, your own, uh, your own company? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the truth is it was uncomfortable. It was hard. And I think that's what I loved about it. You know, for me, a lot of things kind of came easy to me in some of my teenage years. You know, I competed nationally, like I said, in karate. I got decent grades uh, in school. I played basketball. And a lot of those things, yes, I worked hard. But up until that point in my life, most of the things that I was good at also came somewhat naturally to me, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, entrepreneurship and sales was the first thing that really, uh, really rocked me. Like I kind of, well, not a kind of, I sucked at it at first. <laughs> Fonzie, uh, you feel familiar you know, on this? <laughs> here, here's the reason I'm like, sorry I interrupt, but like Fonzie was like yeah. the natural athlete. Like he would like, just like relax and then he'll go play soccer and he'll score like seven goals. And you know, I, I was like the fat brother that I had to like work really hard for like, you know, try to keep up with this guy that was really good. And uh, you know, the sales that. journey on our side has not been easy for sure. Like in, in any way. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very curious to, to continue to, to go through that, to, to listen yeah, to, to that. I, I, I'm going to totally relate. I mean, I think two things. The, the, the fact that I wasn't good at it um, and it really challenged me, I think is the first thing that made me kind of fall in love with it and fall in love with who I would have to become and what I would have to learn and the process of it. So to answer mm -hmm. that part of the question, that's kind of what initiated it. And then the first steps I took to develop the mentality or to get good at the skill sets was uh, one, the company I was working with at the time had something called Leadership Academy. And so I decided while in college to apply for that Student Leadership Academy program. Yeah. Um, and that's where I was being exposed to some entrepreneurship. And secondly, that's where I fell in love with personal growth. That was my first exposure mm -hmm. um, to really, for me, it was two main uh, mentors or, 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 or gurus that I really studied for those first five-ish years of my career. And that was Tony Robbins in John Maxwell and mm. anything I could get my hands on as far as reading, listening. I remember this dates, you know, back to when I got good at that, uh, when I was learning that stuff, but it was, uh, I was watching a late night infomercial and I remember Tony Robbins was selling his CD series. So uh, <laughs> this was before, right, obviously streaming or anything. And with the few dollars that I had extra, I remember I called in and I bought his entire CD series. I filled my six CD changer uh, in my car. <laughs> I put all six CDs. I replaced all the 90s music CDs I had in there at the time. Yeah, and yeah. I remember I put six CDs of his. And at all times for the next three years, my car became like a mobile uh, library, a mobile classroom. And that really began the process of learning mm. entrepreneurship and exposing myself to that. Yeah, yeah. I love that story. That, that resonates a lot. We... We used to drive a lot for uh, <laughs> one of the jobs that we have, kind of coaching uh, little little kids on soccer. 300 like, miles a week. Yeah, oh, 300 oh. miles a week. Yeah. And we need a lot of Pizza Hut uh, money <laughs> for that guy over there. <laughs> and it, it was a lot of, you know, podcasts and audiobooks. Just kinda, and, and that's what kind of like trigger that thought of, huh, maybe we can yeah. do something for ourselves, right? Maybe we can yeah. we can build something. I'm, I'm pretty curious, though. I mean, you've had a pretty successful career in karate, right? And, um, you know, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of disciplines that translate from there 
to sure. what you're building right now. Um, sure. I did practice myself some martial arts, you know, <laughs> for for a little bit, but uh, I never stuck to it. I actually, I don't know if you're familiar with Tai Chi. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. yeah. I practiced at that thing for like a few months, and man, that thing was slow. <laughs> uh, it was so slow. And I, I would like close my eyes, and I was like, okay, go as slow as I can, and then I would open my eyes, and everybody was like, still at the beginning. I was like. I'm out of here. This is too slow for me. Uh, you try you try mantis for a little bit. Yeah, you try, try mantis. another you know martial art in there. But the point is, a lot of those things. You know, he, wa he wants to fight you, Michael. That's what he wants to do. He I was, was like, hey, I was hey, let's preparing do it. for today. You know, let's go in the cage. Uh, we'll have to stream. We'll have to stream that live as a yeah. follow up episode, part two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sounds yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Like interview <laughs> plus fighting. That'll be that'll be pretty yeah. epic. Uh, I'll yeah. get my ass beat, but that's okay. I'll do it for the views. You know. Uh, yes. But the the point is like. I met a lot of people that were that had that had a lot of clarity actually that they practiced yeah. that and they had a lot of discipline, and I was kind of always curious how does that translate then into real life? Yeah. And now we're more than ever. I'm interested in how does that translate into an entrepreneur's life? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, at your age, doing Tai Chi is definitely going to be too slow for you. Because when you <laughs> asked if I'm familiar with Tai Chi, the answer is yes, I'm familiar with Tai Chi because all like my 60 year old aunts and uncles do it. <laughs> so I think I think you're not in the age range. You're not the ideal client ideal of Tai Chi. Yeah, That's yeah. true. Yeah, you're not the client <laughs> avatar. But to answer your question, I mean, I get asked this often, and there's a lot of different things. I mean, I started karate when I was three. You jokingly mm. said as part of the intro, the real karate kid. But I mean, to give you an idea, the karate school I started at didn't take kids until I think they were five or six years old. Oh, wow. And I convinced my mom at three and a half to convince the teachers there to <laughs> let me start. This is how much I was obsessed with the movie, The Karate Kid. Your my first sale. Brother, that was your first yeah, sale. My right first there. sale. <laughs> <laughs> my first sale. My, my little brother's name is Daniel. <laughs> like Daniel's son from the movie, because I convinced my parents to name my little brother Daniel because I was obsessed <laughs> with the movie. But um, That's awesome. th three things that come to mind that how they relate to entrepreneurship is uh, number one, not quitting. There's a time to transition and pivot in businesses, but the reality is that more times than not, you will win if you don't quit. Mm -hmm. And I remember like in the peak of me competing and going to tournaments and all that type of stuff, it was between 14 and 20 years old. And those were the years that I would rather have been doing just about anything other than training four or five, six days a week. I'd rather have been hanging out with friends or yeah. uh, really yeah. anything, right? Yeah. Um, and my parents wouldn't let me quit. And there's a, there's a big lesson in not giving up on something that you're great at and can serve you, even when you just in the temporary emotion yeah. Don't feel like it. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one is martial arts is one of those things that is constantly about getting a little bit better and competing with yourself. And so I think you really learn along the way to enjoy the process of you having to get better every day and not paying attention to results too much and not paying attention to a lot of the external things like trophies and awards and everything like that. Because the reality is more times than not, we'll accomplish and create amazing things when we just focus on doing the things daily, mm -hmm. consistently over a long enough period of time that yeah. lead to outstanding <laughs> results. Um, so that's the second thing that I think really helped is the, the constant focus on the process mm -hmm. and getting better a little bit every day. Um, and then the third one is, you know, we have, we have, we have what's called our eight key concepts in the karate that I started with, and it just grounds you in an important set of values. And I think when we as human beings know what we're all about and who we are and our values, you know, in, in that martial arts, we, you know, as early as five years old, we were being instilled with things like honesty and yeah. humility and confidence and stuff like that. And so having a core set of values is part of your identity mm. uh, as an entrepreneur, make sure you don't get swept up and just chasing a bunch of silver bullets and knowing kind of who you are and who you want to be in the world. So yeah. I could probably give you a dozen lessons, but those are the three <laughs> that stand out right now. I, uh, I'm going to call you sensei from now on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I well, love it. <laughs> you know, Michael, you, you mentioned humility and um, I'm curious because, or that always told us to be humble, right? play and all that stuff. But, you know, when I see the marketing side of things, I'm not saying don't be humble, but I feel like there's a, there's a line in there. There's sometimes sure. I feel like you're ripping yourself to be humble. You might be censoring yourself or you might be afraid of like, you know, promoting yourself, putting yourself out there. And, you know, that is something that I personally experienced, right? With thinking about being, you know, humble, humility, whatever. 
So I'm curious, like, did some of these values eventually presented a challenge in your identity on who you wanted to become, right? Or who you became right now? Yeah, that's such a great question. And it's like you've been following my personal growth journey over the last five years, <laughs> even though we only met uh, recently. <laughs> yeah. so my mom, one of my mom's favorite words and, and values in our family is humility. And about three to five years ago, as I was growing this business and growing online, because my first businesses were all in person, knocking doors, direct sales, in-home presentation, stuff like that. But when I started my online coaching businesses, it was really the first time that I was scaling online. And it presented conflict with who I had valued myself in being up until that point, in this case, humble. But then marketing online is oftentimes feels like the opposite of being humble. You're oftentimes shouting out how awesome you are or, or how much money you made. or how, And so there really was a conflict there. So to answer your question, yes, there was a period of time where I felt like there was some conflict. Mm. Where I finally started to get clear on where I stood um, on the polarizations of humility or just straight bragging is when I pulled up the definition of humility in the dictionary, or at least on Google. I don't know if that's the real dictionary, <laughs> um, but at least on Google. Yeah. And I remember it said something along the lines of like humble or humility is a low view of one's own importance, something like that. And that's not what I thought the definition of humility was growing up. And so when I read that, I was like, wait a second, I don't have a low view of who I am, the value that I bring to the world, right? The programs that I offer, I don't have a low view of those things. I have a very high view yeah. of the value that we bring to the world. And so if I'm sharing that, that's not bragging, that's not being humble, right? And so that's where I started to find, like, there's a difference between just, I guess, like bragging yeah. Out of, uh, out of a place of chasing validation for our own ego. And there's another thing to completely own the value that you bring to the world and be willing to share it. Yeah. Oh, that, that's so good. Um, you sharing that definition. Uh, and it, it's funny cause like I personally haven't never looked the, the real definition, right. And I yeah. was like, yeah. always be humble on the thing. And I remember a very specific moment where um, when I was 15, I traveled to Italy to play soccer there for a year. I was recruited what, cool. what one of the teams there and it was a, a pretty big deal back home. Like that was, that was our dream. Right. And I remember coming back and everybody was like, Oh my gosh, congratulations. This is so amazing. Like just praising. Right. And I remember yeah. in that moment feeling, uh, divided, right. In one, one side wanted re to really enjoy that and be like, heck yeah, I earned yeah. this. Right. Like we worked yeah. really hard. I play, I trained just like you five to six times, like, uh, yeah. sometimes multiple times a, a day, um, yeah. during the week, it was like going from one practice to weight training and then coming back home at nine to do homework. Like it was just really challenging and be like, part of me was saying, Hey, yes, like I deserve this and more. Right. But the other side was the conflicting side of, no, we gotta be humble. Right. We gotta be like, Oh no, thank you yeah. so much. Oh yeah, it's you know almost by chance. Like oh yeah, we're lucky. Like you know, thank God that this just happened. And I remember the decision that I made at the time on how I was uh, I was approaching that was oh yeah, thank God. Like you just worked out. Oh, I'm, I, instead of like leaning into the real feeling, it's like yes, I earned this right. So how does that translate in, in our journey right in the fast like? last five yeah. years that we've been building Bistros and the media company and uh, and what we do is it, just that. So I, last year, I kind of reached a moment where like, screw it and be like, we have to own this, right? And I think that has been part of the evolution of this. Uh, each of us is in an, in our own personal journey as well. And But that has yeah. been one of the main I'm, I'm way ahead of him. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're still right there. more evolved, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But there's obviously some challenges, right? And we, if we bring that in the context of content, right? Because we yeah, gotta be in yeah. front of a camera. We have to be yeah. sharing these testimonials, sharing the wins that our people are getting. We gotta share the results that our clients are getting, right? Like we gotta be sharing all these good things, right? Because it's what, like you said, the value that we bring up to the world, right? It can be very conflicting, right? We yeah. have yeah. Th this amazing person in real estate that we're helping at the moment and the self-talk, uh, it's funny, we've noticed it in some of the calls and we record uh, kind of, we call it top of funnel awareness content, right? We jump on calls and we do this, yeah. but immediately it's like the self-talk is very negative. And I'm like, okay, this is like one of the mental hurdles that we, that we need to, uh, you know, 
uh, go past and, and shattered. And I, that's why we love these type of conversations because hopefully it's going to help somebody that is having that fear of getting in front of the camera, whether that's a CEO, CEO, yeah. CMO, they're trying to delegate it to a team because they don't want to do it themselves. Like we got to own those things because the value that we bring to the world is, is so important. So thank you so much for bringing that, so that true. reflection to, so to the show. And if I can add one thing to that, I think, you know, at least where I stand currently and I reserve the right as I continue to evolve myself, you know, I might think differently years from now, but, but as far as right now, I think the distinction there with the, um, the conflict between humility is about intent and energy, mm. right? And intent and energy behind, am I sharing this to take and to get right? Validation of my own ego. Like, come on guys, look how awesome I am. Or is the energy and intent of me sharing this to give, to inspire, mm -hmm. right? And I think what we're sharing just to get, it does feel a little bit like it's all rooted in ego. And someone would come to you and say, hey, like, I think you could deserve, I think you could benefit from being a little more humble. Yeah. But when it feels or the energy, the intent behind sharing it is like, hey, look at what I did, take it or leave it. I think it could serve you though. And it's very much unattached for yourself, but it's about what it can give to others. I don't think that carries a brash, bragging mm -hmm. energy to it. I think that yeah. has a lot of humility rooted in it. And so the distinction I stand is right now where I'm willing to just blast and share how awesome I think our programs are, or my company yeah. is, or how awesome I think I am, right? Yeah. Is when it's in a grounded state of the energy of giving. Yeah, so absolutely. I just want to share that. Yeah, we, we, we've had some conversations in the past that there's a fine line between confidence and, you know, bragging and... Yeah. And it, it can easily be sensed, right? Like that energy can be sensed by, you know, whoever's on the other side of the conversation. Yeah. And when it's confidence, you know, it gives confidence to the other person to make a decision, right? If you're selling, let's yeah. put it on the context of selling. If you're confident, the other person is going to feel confidence of making a decision of going with you. But if it's bragging, yeah. right, again, thin line, but they're going to know and they're going to be like, ooh, they are BSing yeah. me right here, right? And they yeah. just going to move on to the next thing. Facts. This yeah. was so good. All yeah. right. So you've you've built uh, multiple uh, seven figure businesses. I've so sold a ton of money and uh, and I've added a ton of value to to a bunch the, of companies. I think the figure is like a hundred million in sales, something like that, or more than a hundred million in sales, right? Yeah, over a hundred million. I mean, this, so ready? Watch. Here's the, here's the humble side. Of me <laughs> I knew it. I was, I was gonna say, don't be humble. Say it. Just say it. Uh, you know, the humble side of me coming out is like, and and, and yet I still feel like. We're so small in the big picture of you know yeah, yeah. revenue in the world, but yeah, the, the sales organizations that the teams that I've run have generated a hundred million dollars in, in sales revenue. That, that's awesome. So my my question is like on our, on our side, right? We we build these fractional content teams, right? And it has been a, a, an interesting journey on how we got there and how we've been able to develop internal systems and processes to be able to deliver right on on our product and our service. I'm curious, yeah. like when you made that transition, right? Like when you started building those teams, what are some pe some things that people should be looking forward right because we do believe that every single company needs to be their own media company right they have to have like that internal team how is that translating currently is like they just bring a video editor and then they figure out that we need scripts and then we figure out that we need to like distill information for the clips and the short form content that's coming out and i'm blowing up right so all these pieces obviously the ecosystem is evolving very quickly but at the end of the day right each company should have that internal team that that happens so you know where we sit in there it's kind of like have in the middle like if if they're not quite full internal team where that fractional team that comes in and we've done that transition to full-time uh bringing like a full-time team for them but i'm curious like obviously we've come out so on the content side with challenges on the sales side what's something that people should be looking forward um or or keeping an eye on as they build their own internal teams so I want to make sure I'm understanding the question you're asking because sales and marketing is such a deep topic that I could spend the next six hours talking about. Yeah. Um, so if a comp if someone is owns their own company and they're building out their own sales team, yeah. So what are some things to be aware of? Yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. Let's focus on the team side, right? Like, what are some like uh, maybe frameworks, uh, principles that we should be like sticking to? Right. We love to talk about principles instead of like the tactics, right? Tactics as just little things that we can sprinkle here and there to to sure. boost things. So. If we can focus on that, that would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, the first thing to look at is their mindset about sales, right? Like, do they do they get excited about building out a sales team or do they view sales as like an obligation? Like, I'm, I don't love sales, but I have to, like, is their mindset behind sales that sales is a good thing? Sales is a service. Sales is the bridge that, you know, bridges the gap 
between the problem that a client has and yeah. the solution that we want to bring, right? And so the first thing to look at is the mindset that the entrepreneur or business owner has behind or about sales before anything else. Yeah. Then from there, uh, the second thing is, yeah, right. It's not just about the strategies. Then the second thing I would look at is the, it's not just the tactics and the strategies, it's the principles. And so at that point, I would look at what is the culture that we are cultivating within the sales organization that breeds a winning or championship or producing uh, team or organization. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, think about it, like you can give someone the perfect script, but if the culture of that sales team is we cut corners or the culture of that sales team is we don't finish strong, or if the culture of that sales team is that um, hitting targets doesn't matter, they could have the perfect strategies and still be in an environment where they're not going to produce or win. Yeah, so the second yeah. thing I think that is extremely important to look at is, is the culture of the organization that's being produced. If you're a sports fan, it's like, you know, the, the, the Patriots and the Jaguars, they might run a lot of the same plays. They might even have a lot of talent on both of their teams. Why does a certain organization or whether you're looking at the Yankees and the Marlins or whatever sports team you're looking at, right? Yeah, it's yeah. like, why do certain organizations find a way to continue to thrive? It's rarely just because they run better plays. Yes, talent is important. Right. That gets undermined. Like, yeah, you got to go get talent and a players, uh, but also put them in a winning culture uh, and and thriving environment and organization. And then lastly, um, clarity on top of funnel of three three parts. Right. Lead generation, lead cultivation, lead conversion. And I think one of the reasons why some sales organizations also struggle is they don't commit to one strategy. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, well, we're going to try this and try that and try that up until a certain amount in revenue, businesses will benefit from committing to one strategy. This is how we generate leads. This is how we do sales. But it's mm -hmm. when they're kind of like, well, this guy said to do a two call close. And this person said to do a one call close. And this person said to do this and that, that it actually waters down the confidence of the team early on. I'm not saying not to be open-minded and innovative to how to continue to improve. 100%. But more times than not, people struggle to grow because they struggle to pick one channel, one strategy, one way to grow. And so they're chasing too many things at once. Uh, mm. That's so good. Okay. So uh, your, your episode is full of like three parts frameworks. So it's going to be amazing. So the, the team is going <laughs> to get some, some good info here. But, you know, we talked about mindset and the belief around sales, right? Like what are the principles? Uh, what's the culture around your, your team, right? And then clarity on that top of funnel, right? Like mm -hmm. the lead yeah. gen, the lead cultivation and the lead conversion. And it's not very different, right? Of building a content team, right? On the same side, I remember when we first built our own internal team, we were like, hey, you guys are jumping on this bus. Here's where we're going, right? And and it, it has evolved and, and the right culture yeah. has been great because there's been some pivoting along the way. Now on the sales side, that has been very fun too. Obviously the show is a big, a big driver for us, uh, but also we've been that victim of like, you know, this person do this and then they do this framework and then yeah. feed people into a group and the community and the thing and the podcast. And, and there's been a lot of conflict into and lack of clarity on that side internally too, what, yeah. which we're navigating, right? Like it, 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 it's part of part of the game. So I really appreciate you. You bring in this up to that. You, you didn't mention, right? There's a, there's an amount, there's a threshold of people should be focusing on like just one strategy, right? What's that? Is that amount based on industry? Is that amount based on your own personal goals? Right? Because uh, I feel like we should give the people maybe a roadmap. I'm like, okay, uh, if there is a roadmap, right? Uh, is it something that people just decide? Companies just decide? Like, what? What's your take on that? Yeah, I think it is industry dependent because of the um, amount of a unit, right? Think about it. If I'm a real estate agent and each unit that I sell is six hundred thousand dollars, right, in sales. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that changes the context of yep. it. If I were to say, well, once you get to blank, but I work with a lot of like online consultants, coaches, course creators and stuff like that. And so the way my brain thinks about that, especially from an organic side is most coaches could stick with one channel and one sales strategy to a couple hundred thousand dollars a month, hmm. bare minimum, bare minimum. Um, I tell a lot of our students to not even focus on multiple channels until they're doing 50 K a month. 
Wow. Right. It was around 50 K a month when I was growing my own business that I just went all in on Facebook. Before that, I was trying to do Periscope, Twitter, Instagram. If you guys remember Periscope, <laughs> yeah, <boy. laughs> I was doing Periscope, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera. I just went all in on Facebook till about 50 to 80 K. Once I got mm. to 80 K a month, then I went to a little bit more of what I called my big three. That's when I went LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. Um, but it was about picking one channel and one strategy, at least minimum to 50K a month. But I think most businesses could stick with one channel and one strategy to a couple hundred K a month. Yeah. Dude, I'm curious. Like, I want to hear kind of like a breakdown of that strategy, if I'm being honest. You know, earlier you mentioned one of your clients. You said Bastian. I'm pretty sure yeah. I know who this guy is. is does he live yeah. in, in Europe? I don't want to share like his full name, but like, does he live in <laughs> Europe? Yeah, he does. And he, he's open about the fact that we work together. We were just together in Portugal the other day. Yeah, um, yeah he lives in Europe, though. Yeah, dude, he, he's hitting my DMs hardcore all the time. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to lie, like, I, I love it. Like, I've seen his stuff. I always answer, you know, uh, but he's there consistently. And yeah. I'm pretty, really surprised with his story. He has a really cool mm -hmm. story. And I know he's had, you know, probably multiple coaches, multiple people that he has worked with. Sure. But uh, I'm pretty surprised. Like, I actually know somebody that works with him, too, that's had some, some good success. So, yeah. you know, I'm curious because I know he goes hard on Facebook, too. So yeah. what can you break down the strategy for us? Well... I think the, b before the strategy, what we were just talking yep. about, the, the principle is picking one mm. channel and one platform, right? Yep. And so I'll work with students and they're like, yeah, I get most of my students from Instagram. I'm like, then why are you wasting your time on TikTok right now <laughs> when you're only at 20K a month? I'm like, double down on how to expand your audience on Instagram since that's where you get most of your students. I think of one of my students, Fritz, yeah. right? And uh, he grew from 50K to three, almost 300K a month. Wow. And one of the conversations that we had was, you know, I get most of my stuff on Instagram. So why am I bothering with like ads and this, that, mm -hmm. and the other? Yeah, I'm going to dabble with those things. But really one of the things, well, two of the things that helped him scale was number one, how to extend his client's LTV, like how to increase his retention. And then number two, realizing I get so much business on Instagram. Why don't I just triple down? He actually tripled down mm -hmm. on the number of setters and uh, how much he was focusing on growing his audience over there. So the strategy, Luis, that we're referring to here yeah. is once you're clear on the channel and the strategy that's generating a majority of your revenue, that you have proven you can sell consistently on that channel with that strategy, too many people then go, all right, cool, I'm getting revenue here. What other strategies are out there? I'm right? Instead of saying, how do I double down and triple down on the strategy Yep. Right. And optimize or maximize what I can get from this channel, then expand and scale yeah. uh, to other strategies. So that's Absolutely. the thing that I was talking about. Ju there. Choose yeah. the opportunity, baby. Okay. So uh, th th this is. This is we got, we got some uh, rethinking to do over here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Always. Right. Like, and this is why we love having these conversations. Right. Yeah, but, um, so, so here. I have maybe a comment and 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 maybe a, a question for you. But here here's the thing, yeah. right? Obviously, for context, right? We're talking on sales processes, right? Like the outreach for those people, like the the setter, somebody that prepares for and and, and puts the call on the calendar, right? And all this thing on the sales environment. Now, uh, do you guys on the content side, right? Like where how we started, the initial thought of how we started building our frameworks the, that we call the M2M was we need to be everywhere, right? That evolved into everywhere where our audience is, which is relative omnipresence, right? And uh, that has been an interesting journey, right? Because with that thought in mind, we were able to build a machine that requires not too much time from us, but the production output allows us to be in multiple places at multiple times. Now, Mm. That we call that the safety net of content, right? So let's say yesterday, for example, right? We we went into and we published on Shorts, Reels, and TikTok. Same clip, right? Uh, different versions. Shorts grabbed a lot of traction immediately. It translated into podcast downloads, which is exactly what we want, right? But we tested sure. these different things. So capacity-wise, right? We talk about this in the publishing pyramid. It doesn't require too much time, obviously, if you have the resources on on the team that can execute on that, right? If it's just you, it might be a little bit more challenging. Uh, it allows us to 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 do this. Now the sales outreach, right? In that's why the podcast is like one of the funnels for us, right? Is the people that listen to us, higher quality, they spend more time, they come to us and they request that sales outreach. You mentioned that has to be like hyper focused. Now, what's your view on the content? Because uh, what we found is like if you have this safety net of content that 
maybe actively you're distributing, right? The focus is just let's put it out there because there's going to be some people that are going to trickle and the focus initially might not be there, but that's going to increase what we call art, right? Your authority, relevancy, and trust. And we've seen it in yeah. events. Last year in Funnel Hacking Live, we went out and uh, if you're familiar with the event, obviously they give yeah. like the million dollar yeah. prices, right? We, we, we haven't gotten the million dollars in sales yet, but you know, we go, we go out and I'm going to the bathroom and we run into these two people and they're like, congrats guys. And we're like, oh, awesome. Thank you. But like, why? And they're like, uh, are you guys receiving the, you know, the two comma club? And we're like, no, but I see you guys everywhere. Right. So the, the perception of that audience, right. Of us being present everywhere. Uh, and that depends on many things, right. Whether that's the service or the product that you sell, like different things. But it, it was very curious in my mind. I'm like, huh, the perception of people outside is normally way higher than what we consider inside. So I'm, I'm very curious on your side, on the content side, have you guys thought about, about that aspect? How do you guys tackle it with your students or your companies that can help that sales process or that sales principle that you guys implement? Yeah, I mean, it's a great story and I've thought about that a lot. And if it's okay, I challenge challenge back on something that you sure, said, yeah? Sure, sure, absolutely, bring it. Challenge accepted. So <laughs> social, media, social media is such an interesting world because exactly what you said, Luis, it's like the perception was that you're everywhere and yet the million dollars in revenue wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing I wanna challenge back on is that I have students that are on one platform that feels like nobody knows who they are and yet do a million dollars. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so you can have the perception of being everywhere, but the revenue is not there, or you can just have the revenue. And one of the things I said earlier on when I was learning social media is I said, what I realized about selling high ticket, at least, is that I used to say to people in a mastermind I was in, I would say, hey, you, you might get 10x more engagement than me, and you might have an audience 10x the size of me, but I'm going to make 10 times more money than you. And at the end of the day, that's what most people are in the business for is yeah, uh, yeah. not just the fame, but also early on uh, to make the money. And so the reason why I got clear on that and the reason I was saying that is because, yeah, you could have be uh, to omnipresent. That's a point you brought up. I don't have a fault with being omnipresent. I think being omnipresent is important. Um, yeah. I have two beliefs about, you know, being omnipresent early on. Number one, if it doesn't cost you a lot of resources, time or money to duplicate it, then it's then yeah, of course be omnipresent. But if it's number two, taking away from your focus in generating revenue, yeah, that's where you want to niche down, mm. right? That's where you want to focus down on, on where you're putting your focus. But if it's not costing you Love time it. or money, then yeah, reduplicate everything. But go all in on one channel or one strategy until you're generating uh, the revenue. Yeah. Uh, second thought, of, oh, good, good. No, no, uh, well, we'll hit your second point real quick. By the way, what you're saying, I agree a hundred percent. So part of our job is explore content frameworks, right? Like, so, so we test a bunch of stuff. Um, and I'm very curious on obviously, um, the, the people that come in, obviously they have their own products established. When we started a company, there was no product established, right? So we had to like, on that side, we had to fit, find market fit, uh, see what the process was for the service, right? And different things. And we have been like super open. So that's why this is so, uh, interesting initially for us, but also for people that are building things. A lot of people that listen to the show, keep in mind, are building things. They might be, yeah. they might not be coming in with like a product or a proven market, right? And they're testing this thing. So uh, with that with that in mind, that's why the question came up, right? Because those are very common questions. And uh, how do we connect content with the sales process is so important. And I love that you're helping us navigate yeah. through that. And uh, by the way, before you go into your second point, how can people connect with you uh, if they wanna be, uh, if they're interested in, in learning more on all these yeah. topics. Well, for sure. If someone wants to learn how to unlock all the hidden pockets of revenue, whenever I'm on a show, my team puts together a free bonus. You can just go to www.champdev.com backslash free. And uh, there are free mini courses on our LTV method on how we help six and seven figure businesses unlock six to seven figures of hidden pockets of revenue. So that's the first thing. Awesome. But the two best places to follow me are just organic, right, right on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, Mike Chu or Michael Chu, right on Facebook or Instagram. Cool. Also, commercial break done. All right, good second point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my second thought is this. So if it doesn't cost you time or money, of course, be omnipresent. Mm -hmm. But more times than not, when someone's first getting started off is also knowing how to niche or channel down how they're writing their content. You know, I remember the first two years I tried building my business online, I made $2,000 in two years. Yeah. Um, and so I wasn't figuring it out. And here's why. I think a lot of people do this when they move online. They want to be viewed, 
as an authority. So they oftentimes start duplicating the type of content that true authorities are putting out. So that would be like someone being like, I'm going to start doing reels just like um, Alex Ramosi's doing. Oh, hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> or, or I'm just going to start putting out content like Tony Robbins does or, uh, or, or Gary V or whatever, anything like that. And the, the problem is the only thing they're missing while they're trying to be omnipresent and look like an authority is they're oftentimes lacking the depth of actually being the authority, right? Like you can make content <laughs> like Alex Ramosi, but you're missing one thing, having just sold your businesses for whatever the number was, $46 million, yeah. right? And so you're missing that context. Here's how to bridge that gap and how I, with a small audience, was able to grow my business as quickly as I stopped trying to write content from a place of like just teaching the generic. And I started more sharing my story like a daily online journal about what I had went through. I actually heard Alex share this on a podcast recently. He's put it into words better than I had ever even put it in. And he said he just shifted his content from how to, to how I. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing content, when I was brand new, it was just like, hey, I'm not the weight loss guru for everyone. My first business is a peak performance business for um, direct sales leaders, entrepreneurs, and executives. And you know, I'm not the guy that you're gonna put on the cover of Men's Health. Oh, come I'm, on. I'm the, <laughs> I, you might put me on the cover of Black Belt Magazine. I'm, I'm not the person that you're going to put on the cover of like with the perfect physique for like men's health or something like that, if that makes sense. Right. And so if I just yeah. try and write content all about like how to have the perfect physique as if like I am the expert of, for, for everybody, most people would be like, who the hell are you? In fact, I remember I tried testing ads and people were like, you're too Asian to teach me how to lose weight, stick to karate, right? Oh, or they're like, you're too scrawny to teach me. I, I think this, this shit was hilarious. Like, what was it? But, what, but when I finally shifted to how I finally put muscle on while being scrawny, how I uh, got back into the best shape of my life after building my first seven figure business, all of a sudden the right people started coming to me. So mm. my second point was yes, be omnipresent to get attention. But at the end of the day, if you want to focus on just converting and connecting with the people you're meant to serve early on, it's not about trying to be seen by everybody. It's about connecting with the right people. Yeah. I'd rather connect with less people than a more highly aligned to serve than connect with a lot of people that I'm low qualified to serve. And mm. so those are my two thoughts on content and omnipresent. And especially, especially when early on <laughs> studio, studio claps, studio, the, right? the audience going yeah. crazy, golden, golden boulder <laughs> moment. There you go. There especially you go. <laughs> especially when you don't have the clout that Hormozzi has in selling his business yet, or you don't have the name Tony Robbins says, this yeah, is how yeah. you more deeply connect and convert clients. That's awesome. I, I loved it. Um, just going to put this out there. I think what you're doing, what we do is a match made in heaven. We just need to talk about <laughs> offline about this, but no, it's so awesome. Uh, cool. jo jokes aside, uh, this is great. You know, um, I, there's a ton of notes obviously over here. So, yeah. uh, I'm, one, one I'm, second, real quick. I've been enjoying it. That's why I'm like, I'm, I'm speechless at the moment. My head is you're like good. running a thousand going. miles per hour. I'm just saying, I'm just taking notes over here, but I love the way you put it on the how to and how I, and I was, you know, kind of like thinking about it right now the how to kind of talks to how you can do this by yourself, right? Yeah. The how I, you are like your biggest testimonial. And usually a lot of people are trying to sell something that they already experienced as they already changed, right? So you are your, your best case study. And by saying how I, I guess people yeah. can put themselves in your shoes and then imagine themselves being that successful and then thinking, okay, how do I do this? Let me go to the source, right? How can I shortcut the success by talking to the person that already done it? But when you put the content as how to, you're just telling people, go do it yourself, I feel like. And that is yeah, such an yeah. important point because like you said, most people just go for the the how to, right? Type yeah. of deal. I, I, I'm really, I'm going to start implementing the, the how I, and then I'm, I'm going to report back. I'm going to let you know, Mike, Michael, this well, the is great. And, uh, my, yeah. And, and for credit due, I heard Alex say the how I versus how to. Yeah. So he gets credit for the verbiage. But when I heard him say it, I was like, holy shit, that's exactly yeah, well, the sounds... shift I made when I was growing my business and I was stuck at 2K. And then I went to 2K a month and I went to 30K a month and 50K a month in the span of about three to six months. 
And that was the big change I made. I just started yeah. writing content to my ideal client, sharing my journey instead of trying to look like an authority to, authority to everybody. So, yeah. yeah. That's hmm. That's awesome. Um, it, it's funny how you mentioned this. We just, with one of the people that we help on the, with, with the content teams, they just shifted from a weekly podcast to a daily podcast of literally sharing the, the, how I and different things of, of inside of their business. And in the, like the last three days, they're, they're relaunching a book. Um, it's been, it's been really, really positive. Right. So as you mentioned that also, that was one of the moments of clarity that I was like, huh very interesting i'm going back in our journey right with a 45 live we had like three seasons of of that we brought some people on in, into the challenge that was a lot of what we we're doing there so a yeah. lot of a lot of gold in the in this episode Michael. i know that I'm, we have a few minutes i'm gonna um, uh, i'm gonna write a post on how i became a master of tai chi <laughs> <laughs> bro you're, you're you're too venezuelan for to teach yeah, tai chi i'm yeah. saying Still, yeah, ser seriously <laughs> too, too yeah. seriously i, I need on. like 40 more years to be able to <laughs> go young. at that speed i know um michael a couple a couple last questions right like so for somebody that's building their own platform whether that's on their sales side or, or on their content side what's well, something that they can do today to move things forward to move to move things forward on their content side could be content side could be the sell side right like on your side like um i i, I do believe that both go hand in hand right like to yeah. in, in today's day and age so what's something that they can do today to move things forward yeah i mean well a big focus that i work on is helping you know people understand how to extend their clients ltv so i'll start with this number one jay abraham has always said that there are three ways and really only three ways to increase revenue blah 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 right and, and he, for those who've never heard what he says, he says, number one, learn how to get more clients. Mm -hmm. Number two, increase the average price that that client is paying. Uh, and then number three, get those clients to pay or stay longer and pay more often. Mm -hmm. And so the first answer to your question is to evaluate where there's area of opportunity in either of those three ways to move things forward, right? How do I get more front end clients? How could I increase the price or add more value or right? And then how do I get those clients to stay uh, longer. So that's one of the first things that uh, awesome. I would look at. And we apply the maximization model uh, in our business to those three things on a monthly and quarterly basis. We'll look at our data and we'll say, where are there leaky buckets and big revenue opportunities in those three areas? And that's how my brain thinks. My brain's always thinking about efficiency. How can we get more from less? I'm not always thinking, how can I spend $200,000 on ads, right? I'm thinking yeah. about how can I take what we're already putting in what we're already getting and get more revenue out of that. So that's the first thing is I look at those three things. The second big shift, um, just from my own journey of starting the business, when I got into the online coaching world, I was exposed to what the rest of the online gurus were teaching. And that gave me some good framework to get my business off the ground. At, after I got to about 50K a month, after about six months, I said to myself, is this really the way I want to run my business? And what I realized is that I was being taught how to sell all these 90 day, 12 week programs, get clients, they leave, then you got to get more clients, you got to leave, you got to get more clients. And that's not the business I want to build, right? Yeah. I want to build a business that's not just built fast, but built to last, that is predictable, sustainable, and scalable. And so I started to ask myself, is that the business I want to build? And this comes back to content that you were asking about and that they can move the needle forward. And I took a look at how I was marketing and I said, is that aligned with two things? Number one, what I actually want to deliver to clients. And number two, the business that I want to build. And guess what I noticed? A lot of my content and marketing at that point was, I can help you get into the best shape of life, uh, best shape of your life in 12 weeks and you'll never need a coach again, right? We can help you do this so fast. That, and so, yes, marketing is about better and faster. I'm all for that. But I also wanted to make sure I was infusing into my content what I was also committed to doing with people long-term. And yeah. that was helping them get into the best shape of their life for the rest of their life. Getting into the great shape permanently. With my businesses today where we work with other coaches and businesses, I tell them, I'm not going to just help you generate another six figures in revenue. But I'm also going to make sure that we do it in a way that you know you're building your business in a way that is predictable, sustainable, and scalable and leads to not only a business that you love, but a life of freedom that you love uh, as well. And so that's the shift that I started making in my marketing is I stopped just making my marketing all about I can change your life overnight. Mm, but that's yeah. kind of like what social media marketing is. And I started infusing more of what I was going to help people big picture. Yeah. create 
And that started to lead to also increasing client lifetime value because people are now showing up. Here's the analogy I use. People started showing up with my old marketing, just wanting to go to freshman orientation. <laughs> with my new marketing, they now show up wanting to get their diploma. Yeah. Right? They want to go through freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, senior year, and they're showing up with the intent of the bigger vision and the bigger picture. So those Absolutely. are the two things that someone could take focus on right now. Look at the three ways of increasing revenue and see where there's area of opportunity. And then look at content. Is it setting your client and your business up to be stuck in what I call the revenue revolving door, where it's like revenue in, revenue out, revenue in, revenue out. Mm -hmm. Or are you also writing content in a way that leads to getting clients in a way that builds a foundation of monthly recurring revenue? Yeah. Um, and you're building a business that's sustainable. Absolutely. Man, that that is so good. And I mean, that, that speaks to you knowing your audience too, right? Because I'm, I'm not a fan of marketing those quick wins either. I'm a, yeah. you know, but at that, uh, I'm going to be honest, at the beginning of her journey, you're so desperate for those quick wins that that message resonates so much. And that's how we get into this world, right? The the bro marketing. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I do respect a lot Ty Lopez as an entrepreneur, but we were one of those victims of here. I'm in my garage with my Lambo and my books. And I was like, <laughs> I got books, but I don't have the Lambo. What's up? Right. <laughs> and we were victims of that at first. And honestly, lately, every time I just see those quick win ads, I'm just like, I get mad. I'm like, oh man, I got, I had enough. I'm like, I'm ready for the sustainable, right? The predictable, like I'm ready for that, that, that stability on building the business. So um, thank you for sharing. I think that is extremely important in there. And Absolutely. dude, it, it, it has been so good. I think we're going to have to do a part two because I don't feel like we really <laughs> dove into <laughs> like, like the L the LTV so, accelerator, you know, and like no. really finding those those hidden sure. pockets. I mean, we, we sure. kind of talk about kickstarting the whole process. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we're going to have to dive in onto, onto that one. Yeah. So, so Michael, extending the, the invitation, we do have a community <laughs> on Facebook. So if you want to come and do uh, a training and be like deep dive, let's do it inside of the community. Uh, open I'd doors. I'd love to do a part two. Yeah, yeah I'd love to do a part two because a lot of things we talked about today, A, I hope there was value there. And I also think this is what our whole industry naturally wants to talk about, right? Yeah. How to write content, how to get more clients, how to get more clients, how to get more clients. So if I could just say this one last piece. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing inherently bad with the conversation and topics we talked about today because that is a important part of business is getting more front end clients. Like I just said, Jay Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. More clients pay more, stay longer. Yeah. Right. But the reality is that where I think our industry would benefit to evolve right now is that we only, it feels like at least we only talk about getting more front end clients, but that's what leads to that feeling of burnout. The number of people in this business that build a business for two years, three years, five years, and then burn out, right? I mean, I had an opportunity to buy and people still reach out to me to this day to buy their businesses because how they're running the business while it made them money quick, yeah. they burnt out. Yeah. Mm. And that's because our industry is not talking enough about how to generate pockets of revenue, monthly recurring revenue by getting clients to also play full out, like get yeah. incredible results and stay for years. And so that's when I realized I had something different with my health and wealth Academy. Most people said you couldn't even build an online fitness business organically to seven figures. And I remember I woke up after two years and we had 80 to a hundred thousand dollars a month in recurring revenue on the first of the month before we even sold a new client. Yeah. And that's when I realized how I was building my businesses was different than you know, necessarily how the rest of the industry was teaching to run the businesses. And that's what led to the LTV. Yeah. Method. So I, I'd I just, love to do a, a part two. Uh, after, after the first of every month, your sleep must have been like <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Be like, oh, like a baby. Like a baby. Like, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Michael, last question of the show. I know that we have to head out, uh, but where will you be if you never started publishing? If I never started writing content? Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a great question. Um, where would I be? It's hard, to, it's hard to look back and know for sure. I would probably be um, doing a couple of things. I'd either be consulting sales or I'd be consulting the sales departments of seven, eight, nine, 10 figure organizations. I already was doing that when I started writing content. Um, that was, yeah. So I'd either be consulting businesses, um, doing primarily building like an investment fund real estate investing and stuff like that, which is another thing that I enjoy. 
Um, or I probably would have at some point asked myself if I could build a business through martial arts. My family owns a karate school back in New Jersey. I'm down oh, here nice. in Austin, Texas. So I don't get to be as connected with that world anymore. And so I, I might have considered starting a brick and mortar business yeah. Uh, yeah. like that, but I didn't want to be tied to a brick and mortar. But <laughs> if I didn't start content, um, that, that might have been the direction. Yeah. I, would have I was going to ask if you're going to build a karate. Is it called a dojo? Is it a dojo <laughs> or no? <laughs> Yeah, some, depending on what type of style, but dojo is a pretty common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to ask. I was pretty curious. You know, I'll be like, hey, I'll sign up. I'll, I'll teach the Tai Chi classes. Fun, fun, uh, uh, just say, <laughs> fun, fun fact, Michael, like Fonzie, we have a domain. It's contentdojo.com. No, it's, con, it's, con, it's, con, it's Content Sensei. Content Sensei. Yeah. Nice. And uh, nice. It's somewhere in there, he's like, you bought it like three years ago. And yeah, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping it because I know, I know that thing is going to go far one day. I was like, this is a good one. This is a good one right here. Uh, I shouldn't say this out loud because someone might go buy it and then try and arbitrage it to me later. But based on that, maybe I should go buy the LTV Sensei hey, uh, domain. Yes, <laughs> do, hey, do it now. Do this. it now before tomorrow drops because yeah. they're gonna flip the, the, the domain on you. Because one of you is gonna go buy it right now and try and sell it to me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're like too late, too late, Michael. Oh yeah. man, uh, awesome, man, Michael. Anything else you want to add before we head out? Yeah. Nah, it, was a, it was a pleasure being here. I hope there was value for people today. I, I would love to do a part two purely on LTV stuff because I think people could get value from that. Uh, but it was it was an honor being here with you guys today. Yeah, I think uh, we're going to have to change the headline of this one. But, <laughs> you know, Michael, I, I think I might be in Austin in about two weeks. So I'm going to hit you up when I get there. See next if we next week, dude. Next week. Oh, next week. We're going to be in Dallas. Like yeah. I'll be in Miami next week. Ah, come on. No, 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 no. But next week is Dallas. And then the week above is when I will be going to Austin. Oh, so you're just going, going. I'm just right, gone. I'm good. gone. Yeah. I'm gone. Uh, <laughs> if, I'm in, if I'm in town, hit me up. We can do some Tai Chi. Oh, let's <laughs> go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, guys, for those listening, we're going to be at uh, Podcast Movement next week. Starting on Wednesday, we speak on Thursday. So if you're there, hit us up. Uh, Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure. And with that being said, thank you so much for tuning into the Contents Profit Podcast. Go ahead and follow the show in your favorite podcasting platform and on social media at Biz Bros Co. That is right. And if Michael here help you move one step closer towards your goal, please don't forget to share this episode and and leave a five-star review. See ya. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. <laughs>